Um, hello and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's webinar on financing and the commercial real estate market. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator for today. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from an accomplished scholar at Harvard Business School and author of Forged in Crisis, The Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times, Dr. Nancy Kane. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please click on the Q&A icon in the menu bar below the presentation view. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and his guest, Nancy Kane. Um, Willie will discuss the debt capital markets and the state of the world and economy, followed by a discussion with Nancy about the ABCs of leadership in times of crisis. Thank you for joining us. And now I will turn the call over to Willie. Thank you, Susan. And good morning, everybody uh, on the West Coast and in the Mountain Time Zone. And good afternoon to the, those of you in the East Coast. Uh, this is our third Wednesday webinar. Um, our first was with Dr. Shri Kumar, uh, and the second was with Dr. Peter Linneman. Um, I am extremely pleased to have uh, Dr. Nancy Kane with us today. Um, she's my former professor at Harvard Business School. She is a friend, and she is an absolutely amazing both professor as well as author. Um, to When I asked her to come on this uh, webcast, I said to her that I would shamelessly promote her book called Forged in Crisis. And here's a copy of it. Uh, if you uh, buy it, not only is it a great read, um, but she promised me that if I could get her sales up by 10% today, she'd go back and change my grade in her class and <laughs> turn it up a little bit. So um, let me um, start by saying that when Nancy and I were doing our pre-call yesterday, um, I was very saddened to learn that Nancy lost a dear friend to the COVID-19 virus last week. Um, this virus and its uh, deadly impact um, is coming very close to home for many of us. And so, first of all, um, my condolences to Nancy for her loss um, and to underscore that as we try and talk in this webinar about the economy, about the real estate markets and about leadership, um, none of that is to put aside the very real health care concerns that are going on across the country today. Um, my son, who's 17 years old, loves to go skateboarding, and he, over the past couple of weeks, has consistently asked my wife and me whether he can continue to go to the skate park. And it wasn't until I showed him a story about a 25-year-old former Bates College lacrosse player who is currently in a medically induced coma at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, um, who is suffering from this disease and virus, um, that he kind of woke up and realized the impact that this is having on our world. And so um, it is to be underscored that this is obviously deadly and extremely serious. I might also, as I did a little bit last week, to just underscore the thanks to those people who are on the front lines today. I uh, spent the last hour just before this on my Children's National Hospital board call to talk through how we are responding to the crisis at Children's National. Um, and one of the most heartwarming stories that the president of the hospital said was there is a doctor who has been hit really hard by COVID-19, is at Suburban Hospital in Maryland recovering, and every single day he talks about how desirous it is to get back to Children's National and start providing care again. Um, those are the true heroes right now, the people who are allowing us to not only meet the medical emergency that this is, but then also keep our world running. Um, those people who are delivering packages to our homes, to allow all of us to continue to live in shelter. Um, I just put forth, if you haven't donated to a charity that's helping support these people, if you haven't given a tip to the UPS delivery person, uh, if you haven't dropped a bottle of wine at a healthcare worker who lives in your community, you might just think about um, some form of gratitude and thanks to those people who are on the front lines today and allowing all of us to move forward with our lives. Um, I'm going to review the commercial real estate markets, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to talk about leadership in times of crisis. Um, last week, I talked about emotions and how do you feel. Um, I guess I should share with you all, my current feeling is, is nervously optimistic. Um, I, I kind of look at this sort of like I did my second shoulder surgery, which is that um, I know that there is going to be pain in the actual surgery, and I also knew that there would be a long rehab process after getting my shoulder surgery. Um, but at the end of the day, I also knew that I would be better off at the end of that surgery. And I do look back on the great financial crisis of sort of October and November of 2008, when we had no idea how deep the crisis was going to go. Yeah. And this is very different. We do know 
that we are going to be able to get through this. We do know that we are putting the resources to it to combat the virus, to save lives, and that, that just like a surgery, um, it's going to hurt, but we also know what the other side looks like. Um, we have seen the federal government and state governments really start to move over the last week or two to meeting this crisis. That is so reassuring to see makeshift hospitals that are being built in cities, um, the moving of ventilators from one state to the next that needs them, um, wide distribution of testing. Um, all of that is super, super helpful and encouraging to see us meeting these needs, and it does give all of us some sense that we are going to move through this over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, as it relates to the economic outlook, some of you may have heard James Bullard, the head of the St. Louis Fed, on Squawk Box yesterday. I thought it was quite interesting. Many people are trying to talk about how quickly does the economy snap back. Um, Bullard talked about 20 to 30 percent negative GDP growth in Q2 of this year, um, followed by what he deemed a recovery quarter of Q3. And then surprisingly, he said that he thought that we would get back to unemployment rates of somewhere around 4 percent in either Q4 of 2020 or Q1 of 2021. I would say that Bullard is probably more optimistic than any other economist I've heard talking about the rebound, but he was, there were two things that he said. One, he said that unlike a war or a lengthy financial crisis, the actual infrastructure isn't being destroyed. And then the second thing he said that I thought was great was he said, you have to remember Q2 2020 is an investment in the health of the American public. And I thought that that was really interesting in the sense that we are doing this. We are shutting down our economy to invest in the health of the American people. And when he framed it that way, it made me think about rather than there's this virus that we have no control over, we're actually controlling our actions in our economy to invest in the health of the American public. Bullard was followed by former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, who quickly dismissed any comparisons here to the Great Depression. He's a historian and studied the Great Depression. He reminded listeners that it was a 13-year-long Great Depression. And he said nothing that we're seeing right now is similar to the Great Depression. And he went on to say that it's not even like the Great Financial Crisis, which many of you remember was three and a half years. And in paraphrasing Bernanke, he said, this is more like a blizzard or a natural disaster than it is a traditional economic downturn. So there are two very... Yeah. knowledgeable, informed, scholared economists giving what I view to be quite optimistic views of where we are today, what's going to happen over the next three couple weeks, which I do not want to in any way belittle, but at the same time, keeping our eyes on where are we going to be in the future. Along those lines, I think there are two things that all of us need to keep in mind. The first is the modeling on when we get to peak demand for medical services. As I mentioned last week, we built a model at Walker and Dunlop focusing on student housing beds and how student housing beds might be able to be helpful to meeting the surge in need for hospital space. Um, during the week when we were talking to FEMA, they gave us some feedback on a number of our models. And two of the model assumptions that we changed were two things. One, how many people actually get hospitalized? And the second is how quickly the disease multiplies. And the only reason I raise this as it relates to our models, we're a bunch of real estate professionals who are playing around with models. By no means is our model accurate or nearly as good as anybody else's. The reason I raise our model is because I think it's important for people to understand with a couple changes to variables, the modeling changes dramatically. And so what we did was we took it from 13 uh, we took it from 5% being hospitalized to 13% being hospitalized, which were the New York numbers, yeah. and we lowered the du duplication rate from seven days down to 3.4. And in doing that in the model, it went from peak demand for hospital beds at 650,000 beds at the end of June and moved it up to 2.5 million beds in the middle of May. Yeah. So as you think about your exposure from a real estate standpoint, and when the economy is going to snap back, one of the important things I think to keep in mind is A, the variability of the models, and B, clearly New York is in the eye of the storm today. 
it will likely be back sooner than many other parts of the country. And so you also have to look at that modeling as you roll out across the country and as the disease spreads and the virus spreads across the country. The second point is unemployment. We're tracking unemployment. We're doing it on a congressional district by congressional district basis. Um, and we're showing where we are seeing high rates of unemployment that are tied to the service sector in markets such as Las Vegas and Orlando, Florida. And then other places where the unemployment rolls have not spiked nearly as much, such as in San Jose, California and Austin, Texas. Um, markets that are much more technology focused, much more healthcare focused, much more academia focused. Um, what we've done is we've taken these two models and put them together so that you as our client and partner can play around with the assumptions to get a sense of where is the unemployment hitting hardest, where are your assets, and where are you going to project as it relates to peak demand for hospital uh, services. And then you can get a sense of when do we think we'll be on the other side of this. So if you would like to look at that model, please reach out to your Walker and Dunlop banker or broker and they will send it along to you. Again, we're not claiming to be experts here. We're just trying to show some numbers and allow our clients to have some insight into two things that we view are extremely important variables here. Um, unlike during the great financial crisis, there is liquidity in the markets today. I would first say that the Fed and the Treasury and the Trump administration have done a fantastic job as it relates to taking the playbook off the shelf that was used during the great financial crisis and getting to it much, much more quickly, um, putting significant liquidity into the markets. As everyone knows, the Senate bill passed last week. Uh, the stimulus has $2 trillion uh, in it. And it actually, if you look at the leverage that the Fed is going to provide, it's actually more like a $6 trillion stimulus package. Um, we are seeing life insurance companies and banks predominantly still quoting on non-multifamily assets, mostly office and industrial. I said last week that uh, all-in coupon rates had moved up to sort of four to four and a half percent. Those have come down over the last week as treasury rates have rallied. So we're seeing quotes for 60% LTV deals at around three and a half percent. Um, solid sponsorship and good deals are still getting quoted. Um, and um, we are actually in the process of working right now on a construction loan in, of all places, Orlando on a multifamily property that is supposed to close at the end of April. Um, it's got about a 3.5% coupon on it. Uh, it does have a completion guarantee. It does have a 20% repayment guarantee on it. But if you think about the timing of this crisis, that's a really good loan for that bank to be making. Um, mo in most states, construction is still a uh, necessary activity that is um, outside of the lockdown laws. And if you think about construction workers who are going to get back to work after this crisis passes, um, construction loans should be somewhere that are money good and allowing people to invest for the future. As it relates to spreads, um, I mentioned last week that the Fed stepped in and started buying CMBS, agency CMBS, at the beginning of last week. We saw, as I said on the call last week, swaps on Fannie Mae dust bonds, uh, excuse me, rates on Fannie Mae dust bonds at swaps plus 195. Um, today we are quoting deals at swaps plus 80. So the Fed has clearly stepped in, provided liquidity into the secondary market by buying both treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, and commercial mortgage-backed securities, and brought spreads in dramatically. As those spreads have come in, so have rates. Um, we rate locked this morning a uh, Fannie Mae deal. Uh, it was a $32 million deal. It did not have in it the reserve requirements that Fannie Mae is now requiring to borrow from them. Um, and we still rate locked it at a 332 rate. But that deal was done, if you will, uh, as we entered into the crisis. It got priced today, but it did not have the reserve requirements that Fannie is asking for. About 15 minutes ago, we rate locked another deal that we had to restructure last week with the new reserve requirements. It's a $17 million loan. It's requiring for a million dollars in escrows. The borrower was obviously not pleased that a million dollars of proceeds had to go to escrows for the next year, but we rate locked it at a 272 rate about 15 minutes ago. 
So you can see there that those two deals, the previous one that had pricing um, a couple weeks ago, got rate locked this morning at 332 without reserves. The second one with reserves got rate locked this morning at a much lower coupon rate, but did have the reserves. If I talk about liquidity for a moment, um, we also went out to a line lender to get a very significant warehouse line for a deal that we're going to fund at the end of this month. During the great financial crisis, that line lender would have said to us, thanks, but we're pulling things in. And this is a little bit of a, a segue into Nancy. Um, what we do at times of crisis define us. These are the times where what people do and what people say or what people will remember. And I want to bring a quick anecdote in on liquidity and crises. Back during the great financial crisis, as our line lenders were all pulling their lines, there were only two banks that kept credit extended to Walker and Dunlop. The first was Bank of America, and the second was PNC. But PNC back then was a much smaller bank. PNC made a decision to pull all commercial warehouse lines from every single counterparty they had other than Walker and Dunlop. And Jim Rohr, the CEO of PNC at the time, called me up and said, Willie, you've got a great company. You manage your company exceedingly well. And if there's anyone we're going to work through with through these difficult times, it's Walker and Dunlop. And here I am 12 years later telling that exact story. That was leadership by Jim Rohr. That was a relationship between Walker and Dunlop and PNC that endures to today. And those are the types of things that people will remember after this crisis is over. Um, two other quick things before I turn it over to Nancy. The first is we need to get congressional leaders as well as the federal government thinking about what they do to jumpstart this economy on the backside of this crisis. We need every single resource right now focused on meeting the needs and the health needs of the American public that is suffering from this virus. And at the same time, if we don't have some type of infrastructure bill being thought about and being potentially passed over the next several weeks, to really jumpstart this economy on the backside. As Peter Linneman said last week, the rebound will be a much, much slower and much, much more gradual curve than to some degree what Bullard said yesterday of a much more aggressive bounce back. Um, the second thing before I turn it to Nancy is there's been a lot of talk in the multifamily world as it relates to the Senate bill, now the stimulus bill, as it relates to the 120 day um, prohibition on evictions for multifamily properties that have a Fannie, Freddie, or HUD loan on them. I would just say two things on that. One, that bill does not match up with the forbearance programs that Fannie and Freddie are implementing with FHFA uh, right now, and we're working to try and get the language in those two to match. But more importantly, I would just say to every owner out there, now is the time to focus on your tenants. It's the time to enter into rental forbearance contracts with those tenants who cannot pay to make sure that they do not have the pressures to be able to, to have to pay over the next several months when they are dealing with the very real economic reality of this crisis. But in those rental forbearance agreements, there's also the very real right for you as the owner to expect them to repay you for that forbearance. And so by focusing on the tenants, putting rental forbearance agreements in place that also have the repayment of that forbearance, you can manage your properties, you can manage your tenant base, and with the forbearance that is being provided by Fannie, Freddie, and HUD, you and we will be able to get through this crisis. With that, Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Willie. Um, it's a huge privilege to be here um, before a host of leaders or from around the country and the world. Um, let me start off just piggybacking on two things Willie said. First, um, Crises are defining moments. This is a defining experience of our lives. It may indeed be the defining experience for our kids and our grandkids. Um, and Lincoln said in the midst of the Civil War, when things were going very badly for the Union in 1862, right, dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our cases new, we must think anew and act anew. We must save our country. And he also said in the same speech that we will re remember during this moment in spite of ourselves. So that is an incredibly, I think, apt or relevant observation about our moment. The Civil War was the defining moment of the 19th century for America. This is our defining moment. And people will either, and I've been studying crisis leaders and crisis leadership for 20 years, 
people either get bigger and stronger and more resilient and more expansive in terms of what they can do and how they can do it for a larger number of people during crises, or it's been my experience and my research that people actually contract. They get smaller, they get, they constrict, they they don't, with, most leaders don't wither, but they're less, they're less competent and their character, just like Willie was talking about the CEO of PNC and the character that leader demonstrated during the great financial crisis, their character becomes very obvious. So we will be remembered in spite of ourselves and how we comport ourselves and how we act in this great crisis will, and how we observe other people acting will be how we are remembered and perceived going forward. This is the reference point for the rest of our lives. And that's worth bearing in mind, I think, for people of influence and for people of impact. The second thing I would say is that, you know, we're going to see, I think, and I'm a, I'm a, historians get paid to see the big picture, so I've been doing it for a long time. I think we'll see, to your last comment, Willie, I think we'll see not only another stimulus bill uh, designed for the next six weeks, I think we'll see pretty quickly in, before May gets long in the tooth at all, maybe before April's over, we'll begin to see some federal action. We're seeing it monetarily on the, on the Fed side, but we'll begin to see it uh, in the, on the fiscal side toward what are the ladder, the steps on the ladder that take us out of the nadir of this economically. That's very, very, very important uh, for our, an economy that has much more suppleness, much more efficiency in it globally and domestically, and right, no systemic kind of clogs or obstacles, like Willie was saying, as it did during the great financial crisis. So uh, the, the, the speed and the, and the resilience of the recovery depend very, very significantly on, on government action, national government action, and soon. Um, all right, let me offer here briefly a series of, if you will, ABCs of crisis leadership um, for people who want to get stronger and better during a crisis, which is always an opportunity presented by the grueling, exhausting, and very important work that leaders do in moments of great turbulence. Let me begin with something you all know that Willie referred to indirectly about four times in his remarks, which is we all want to get comfortable. If we're not, we're going to get more and more comfortable, but it's an intentional, there's an intentional aspect to this with navigating point to point. Willie, you just said there's all this there's all this, you know, variance in the models depending on assumptions and, and what we and how we use those assumptions. We know we're all working in models within ourselves, our organizations that, that need to be comfortable with uncertainty and lots and lots of flexibility and navigating point to point. Um, and, and pivoting when we get new information or we realize something we're doing isn't working, pivoting quickly, learning, and then moving on to the next point. That's incredibly important. Um, and it's going to be important, secondly, to communicate not only where we're headed next and what the assumptions are and how the information is flowing, not only to communicate that regularly, but to communicate it in a, in, in a way that has an expected channel to it. So I'm telling every leader, from art museum directors to university presidents to real estate um, leaders like yourself, I'm saying figure out what your method of communication is to your people and your clients. Stay with it. The fireside chat that Roosevelt instituted in 1933, when there was a massive liquidity crisis in the United States, as well as a huge underlying macroeconomic and deepening crisis, those fireside chats were much more than, you know, welcome Americans, here's what I know, don't hoard your money. They were a way of giving people jobs to do in their homes, right? Your money is safer in a bank than in a mattress. They were a way of helping people understand what progress was being made. They were also a way, if any of you are watching Andrew Cuomo's uh, daily press conference in seven days a week, about an hour, 30 minutes of remarks, they were a way of framing the stakes of the crisis. So choose, choose your cadence, choose your, your, your media, medium, and stay with it. It's incredibly important to keeping your people and your organization grounded and working as well as they can. That's the second thing. The third thing I would offer is that all great crisis leadership is a combination of brutal honesty and credible hope. Right? Here's, again, think of Churchill or think of Cuomo, who's doing this, I think, pretty well and getting better at it. He's really growing as a leader. Um, and that's not a political comment. It's a comment from a scholar of leadership watching one get better. But what he does is he begins every briefing with, here's the problem, whether it's hospital beds or it's 
PP, uh, personal protective equipment, whatever it is, here are the numbers, here's the problem, here's what we're doing to deal with that. It, here's when we expect it to get, get worse and worse and worse, and then we believe get better. And then he turns in every briefing now, this wasn't true at the beginning, he turns to the resources we have to deal with that, the practical resources what he likes to call now rolling deployment, right? We'll, New York will need these medical personnel now, and they'll need these kind of this number of ventilators, and then they'll be passed to the next hot zone. So we're, the country is going to be a story of rolling deployment in terms of hot zones and equipment. But he says, here's what we're dealing with practically. And then he says, and here's the resources that New York brings to bear to do that. Some of that is about stamina. Some of that is about discipline. I'm just quoting from yesterday's, yesterday's press conference. Some of that is about courage. Some of that is about everyone doing their job because we have two missions. This is really important. In every communication, you give people the mission or the missions. Two missions. And he says, for most New Yorkers, that's staying at home. And he goes through them very, very carefully, over and over and over. And then... And then, and then the second mission is we have to get our, keep our frontline people safe, and we have to be able to do that with the right equipment and, and, and the right cadence as much as we can. So he, that is a great example of saying this is, really, this is really a hard time. Churchill once began a speech saying the news from France is very bad and, and proceeded to lay out the news. This is right before Dunkirk. And then said, and here's how we will match it even if Britain stands alone. We are determined. We have, we have the ingenuity, we have the courage, and we have the cohesion or the unity. So pointing to those things over and over and over to your people in the midst of brutally honest and very difficult facts is incredibly important. The third thing I would say, and Willie was doing this very well, I thought, at the beginning was you're going to address the emotional piece of this. You, do, you can't take it away for people. You can't take away sadness. You can't take away all the fear. You can't take away people's sense of uncertainty and, 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 and frenzy at certain moments, but you can t hold all those emotions, prevent all those emotions from becoming panic and therefore being destructive or inhibiting to solutions that you and your company need to enact for your clients and your organization. So it's very important to be able to address that fear, right, and talk about, right, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. You're scared. I'm scared. We're all exhausted. But here are some ways to, 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 to deal with that. I mean, Cuomo's telling people to go out for walks and stay six feet away from people, right? Hug your cat, right? If you're alone, call a friend. He's literally talking at that level briefly and succinctly, but in a very insightful way. So address the fear that your people have without being able necessarily, again, to make it go away. The fourth thing I would say, and this is a little bit of a, it, it's, a it's a separate category, so stay with me. How you lead yourself every day, from how you feed and water yourself, literally, your sleep, your, the, the exercise you get, the way you ground yourself, which is, which is really important each day, right? The, the way you recover from a very exhausting or turbulent set of events in your office. The way you do, your feeding and watering of yourself is job number one. Why? Because if you falter for your company, your employees, particularly your family and your friends, then the mission is seriously compromised. So one of the most important things I've learned studying crisis leaders, really good ones, past and present for a long, long time, is they find a way, right, pretty quickly to lead themselves and they stick with the self-discipline, right, and the self-respect and, and the, the fundamental importance of that throughout the crisis. A couple of other things to think about in terms of your leadership. Reflection is really important. We're all so wired in now. We're Zooming, we're Skyping, we're, you know, we're just, we've got phones and televisions and all kinds of gadgets at us. We still need time to talk, to meet with ourselves and to gather our thoughts each day. We still need time to process the massive amounts of information coming in. We still need time to make sense of the five different phone calls with the different sources of information and the different advice that we receive. So let me really strongly urge you to take time. Lincoln used to pace at night in the White House for hours. He would pace up and down the second floor of the executive mansion. Shackleton liked to write in his diary. 
Frederick Douglass liked to write and walk. Steve Jobs, Charles Darwin, all kinds of really effective leaders and thinkers made time every single day to have a meeting with themselves without a gadget, without an aide, without an advisor, to really get right with themselves about what their best sense of the next point to navigate to and what the big picture look like. So reflection, 20, 30 minutes a day, maybe in two 15 minute blocks, really important. Um, last thing I would say about you, and I wanna say two other things before I turn it back to Willie and some questions. Um, it's really important, and the media isn't making this easy for us, because the media is creating almost no credible hope, right? And they're not really addressing fears, except in very indirect and I think largely ineffective ways. It's very, very important, um, given the harshness and the kind of machine gun fire rhythm of the news and so much, so much information about the extraordinary rapid fire spread of this disease, which my friends, around the country, not just in New York, and not just in Boston, around the country is going to get a lot worse for the next three weeks. And anyone that's been studying the numbers I have since January, you can see it, it, it's starting to crest in a number of places. So it's going to get very, very scary. But in that context, it's very important for leaders to not get obsessed with the worst case scenarios. That's always a, a lower probability, just like the best case scenario, than a whole bunch of possibilities under the curve in the middle. And that's what we want to keep steering towards. So I have studied leaders like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Rachel Carson, who were under, you know, their lives were in danger, and they each, to keep themselves their best, purposely, with discipline, turned away from the, last, from the worst case scenarios. Two other things. Uh, we do not master the mountain in a great crisis, as Edmund Hillary said, the Everest mountaineer and the great, the great summiter. We master ourselves. So again, the importance of self-discipline, self self-awareness, uh, emotional awareness. Um, I personally think, from studying leaders um, and, and with great, with you know, relatively intense degrees of intimacy, particularly present-day leaders, that, that crisis leadership is very lonely at times. It's lonely it, because of the confusion. It's lonely because all that you're learning and doing and thinking and planning and creating, you know, plan Bs and and, and safety nets for all of that. Most of that you'll, you'll do with colleagues, but some of it you'll do alone. And so there's a loneliness element to this that I have seen over and over again. I wish I, wish I could tell you, here's, here's the app you download to take that away, but I don't have one and I never found one. I think I can tell you that if, you're, if, if that's part of what you're experiencing, you're in very, very good company. So I can normalize it for you as a coach and a scholar of leaders. And the second thing I would say is, um, it's, it, it's something to, to try and move into rather than push away because it's in some of those moments, those dark night of the souls at 2 a.m., what's going on, how are we going to do this, that some of your most important toning of your resilience muscles and muscles of determination, um, what, that, that some of that really important work is done. So there is a, there is a redeeming, I think, if painful aspect to loneliness. Um, last thing to say. Uh, how you show up, uh, Willie and I got reacquainted a couple years ago after a long period of, you know, some, some, some distant communication, but not frequent communication. I mean, I was not really- that long. Don't, don't, don't put it that no, long. No, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't that long because you're very young. You're very young. I'm, old, I'm much older, but you're very young. But in any event, it was a while. And I've been so struck getting to know him again or getting to know him much more with more frequency, how much he embodies this. So this is something that I always have been struck by since I first started studying Ernest Shackleton, the Antarctic Explorer. Showing up in service to your mission, even on days when you are very pessimistic or very tired or the news for your company and your, 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 your sector is, seems really dark, showing up in service to your mission is absolutely critical. And that literally means kind of core tight, shoulders back, right? Um, you know, not necessarily false optimism, but we're going to do this. Of course we're going to do this. You know, Nelson Mandela once said, I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of research on him, talk about a very interesting leader in different kinds of crises. He said, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to walk into the fear with lots of eyes on you and show up as if you know you're just fine in that fear, even if you're not sure you are. Because what happens is once you show up like that with all these eyes on you, you suddenly realize I'm standing here, I'm grounded, I'm okay, and look at all these other people who are, who are following me and imitating me and realizing 
they're okay, and they can move forward even in this difficult moment. So show up in service to your mission. This is as important for your kids and your families at certain times as it is, partic as it is for your companies. So let me pause there. I've kind of listed through a bunch of ABCs um, that I hope will be useful. Um, but I've seen the, the power of these over and over and over again, particularly in the most intense moments of, of, a great, of, of great turbulence. So thank you, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to dive into a couple questions as it relates to some of the more specific points inside of your book and your profile of these five exceptional leaders. I, I got a question just a moment ago from Roman Orozov who asked, you know, how would you pick these five? And I guess I'd take that a little bit further and say, you know, were there any generalities across all five figures with regard to either their personality or their tactics that made them so successful? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Thank you, Roman. Here, here's the most important common thread, and, this, and this, this also answers how I chose them. They were each people that got enormously, like exponentially better in crises. So Lincoln was a, was a good politician in 1860. He was a great leader morally, militarily, politically, uh, st in terms of his statesmanlike qualities in 1865. So he got massively better. So they got better in crisis because they wanted to work on themselves. And they saw, even in you know, dark, difficult times, that there was always an opportunity to learn something day by day about themselves that they would then, from the inside out, translate into worthy impact. So that was the most important aspect. And the second key aspect, Roman, was they each got hit by a Mack truck in terms of a crisis. None of them saw it coming, none of them expected what they experienced to be so bad, and yet they kept on moving forward, right, and accessing resilience muscles and improvising and, and, and discovering that their mission leading in a crisis was incredibly empowering for them, and that at the same time it transcended them. It was I, it had started as I, and then it became save the organization, make it better, help the environment, and slavery. And so those things, the willingness to work on themselves, getting better in crises, the embrace of a mighty mission, and, and the ways they just got it done for, with great flexibility were all very common themes that drew me to these people. You talk in your book about Shackleton and his physical presence and how he physically showed up every single day. And you talk about leaders understanding that in times of crisis, all eyes are on them. Any thoughts right now for leaders of both, well, we've got listening in on this, government leaders, we've got company leaders, we've got team leaders, and we've got family leaders. Any thoughts in this dispersed world, how people can think about quote unquote image and showing strength in difficult times, given that the closest where anyone's getting to each other is on a Zoom call, and we're fortunate to have about 5,000 people tuned in here. but. Any other thoughts or ideas in these times where that physical presence is so important for leadership, yet we're challenged in, in, in providing it? Absolutely. Well, we are challenged because we're distant, but Zoom and Skype go a long, long way. The, the tone of your voice, the way you hold yourself in front of the camera, your ability. Here's a very important aspect that we haven't talked about. Your ability to frame the stakes of the crisis, right? Here's the, pro here's the larger problem. Here's the things we're working on. These aspects of the problem, these obstacles. Here are the resources. It's like a balance sheet. Framing the crisis is a balance sheet. Here are, the, here are the assets and here are the liabilities. Here are the problems and here are the resources. Here are the, you know, here are the outlays and here are the revenues. It's that, the ability to do that on a consistent basis for every, for every person that you're leading, whether it's your kids or, or, or it's your, your larger family or it's your, your clients and your employees, the ability to do that gives people both trustworthy information. They, people want to stay informed. And then it says, here's what the things we can deploy against those crises or those problems. That's incredibly grounded. So that is really important. And I'd say the last thing is, and this is something you were starting to refer to, Willie, at the end of your remarks, is you've you got to be able to paint a picture of what's going to happen as we move forward. It's, this is not, this is a terrible thing now, and we have to get through it. But we also, to your point, have to be building and thinking and planning depending on our scenarios for whatever would you say june to, through september then september through december we're we're not going to live here forever 
This is, this is going, we are going to move through this. So you have to be able to paint a picture of, of, of the world after the worst of this and then the world five steps from the worst of this so people understand what we're doing and that we're not just acting for tomorrow and the day after that. Talk about that, Nancy, as it relates to Shackleton and Lincoln. Because from reading your description of Shackleton and being on the ice sheet, the, the task at hand was save my, 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 my sailors, uh, get off this sheet, and live for another day. Whereas with Lincoln, he was not only having to be commander-in-chief, but at the same time, he also had to set a narrative for what the Union would look like when the war was over. Talk about that dual challenge on Lincoln where, is it fair to say that Shackleton just had to focus on that or was Shackleton, we gotta get to the edge of the ice cap, yep. then we gotta launch these boats and then we gotta get to an island and so it wasn't just getting off the ice sheet, it was actually surviving that even more death-defying experience. That's exactly what it was. So his future was not, you know, in 19, they were, they were, they were, they were stranded first in 1915 and they, are, they, they get rescued Shackleton brings rescue in, 19, in late 1916. Um, so he did, it wasn't, just, it wasn't, well, here's what's going to happen in 1926, right, in Great Britain when we're all home. It wasn't that. It was just what you said. It was these, well, when the ice breaks and we're, we're in the lifeboat sailing in open water, here's what's going to happen. And then when we get to the island, we get to, when we get to one of these islands on the north, on the western archipelago of, of in Antarctica, here's what's going to happen. So he was still painting a picture. It just wasn't at a grand systems level, but it was critical to have that future point and that future, the next bit of progress for his men, that was as critical to keeping them alive because that was mental medicine as the penguins they shot. Uh, Lincoln began planning for the end of the war and reconstruction in 1863, in late 1863. He's experimenting, he's throwing spaghetti at the wall here, so to speak, in terms of what the country's gonna look like if the Union wins and, my friends, in 1864, in the spring of 1864, when, when uh, Ulysses Grant is bogged down um, in, in, in Petersburg in the, in the spring and summer, it looks like the Union will lose the war. He's starting to plan for what he's going to do in the next six months before he loses the re-election re and the country becomes two separate countries if, if his opponent had won the election. So he was always planning in T equals zero and T plus two and working that way and talking in inspiring ways about the latter. So you talked previously in your summary comments as it relates to both Lincoln pacing in the White House, Shackleton writing in his diary. Um, and and, and you, you, do, you do write, you know, I realized then the loneliness and penalty of leadership that I think is a, is a quote that, that Shackleton wrote. Yep. Any suggestions or tactics to leaders now as it relates to a, how to deal with the stress. B, anything from a routine standpoint. You talked about pacing. You talked about taking care of yourself. But anything as it relates to getting into routines that you kind of do every single day to set a certain tempo to life so that as the world seems to be fraying around you, you can keep that, to your point, kind of you know, chest out and, 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 and back strong uh, in the face of adversity. So I've been talking to a lot of different people recently, people asking about how do you motivate and unify teams working remotely about the importance of routine. So routine's critical. We, anyone that has kids or works with animals knows that routine is grounding, stabilizing, allows people to learn and work and do much better than the absence of routine. The more, the more volatile the surrounding situation, the more important routine. So one of the first, Lincoln had a routine, Shackleton had a routine, all these leaders had a routine, and they had the self-discipline, the self-regulation to stick to it. So I think you have a routine for yourself and your family. I tell everyone, don't do, phone, don't do Zoom calls in your sweatsuits, you know, in your, in your pajamas, right? It's very important to, to have the, 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 the daily tasks that you get done and to stick with that. Shackleton did this with his men religiously every week there was a new duty roster every week there was manual labor for every single man officer and enlisted men every single day there was exercise and then every week their duty roster shifted uh the, the elements of the routine were similar but people were doing different things and for the entire week that's what they did this is a this is this was an extraordinary life or death situation that never came close to mutiny so we could we can see the power of routine lincoln did exactly 
the same thing in what he called the executive mansion in the White House during the Civil War. He had a very strict routine that he adhered to. And that, Willie, to, the, your, to your second question about, or maybe it was your first question about loneliness and, and the difficulty of this, Lincoln found ways of two things. A first, recovering. Right? For him, it was gathering people in the White House to tell funny or raunchy. He loved dirty jokes and really disgusting stories. And he would tell dirty jokes or quote Shakespeare or, and, and, and exchange just kind of tension-free time with people. That was really important. He had two people. This is true for every leader I've ever studied. They have someone that like, is a first mate. Is, is, an, uh, is, the, is the right arm. It can be someone in the office, it could be a family member, someone they trust and that they can kind of bounce things off of and that they can share vulnerabilities because you can't, you're not, you're not supposed, to as a, as supposed to as a leader have no vulnerabilities, have no problem with loneliness, have no angst about what's going to happen. But you need a safe place to recover from those emotions, to restore yourself and to share them. So all the leaders I've ever studied had some one or two people that were like their trusted first mates. And they, those people were incredibly important as backstops and hedges and, and support systems for the leader because no leader does it alone. When you write about Frederick Douglass and his decision to return to the U.S. from Great Britain in 1847, you write, leaders need to decide which trade-offs he or she sorry, is willing to make to move forward. The more crucial the issue, the less certain and security there is likely to be, yeah. and thus the more difficult the potential trade-offs. Can you talk about people trying to think through their trade-offs, and then also um, the framework that you and I discussed yesterday as it relates to Colin Powell's 40% information and 70% information kind of framework? Uh, you know, they're, they're, I think they're very much related. Uh, Willie was saying yesterday in our prep call, he was saying, you know, Colin, he want, what, Willie, why don't you say what Colin Powell said, and then I'll launch into both pieces of his question. Sure. So Colin Powell, a number of years ago, focusing on military decisions, said that if you have less than 40% of the applicable information to make a decision, you don't have enough information to make a decision. Yet if you wait for over 70% of the applicable information, you've waited too long and you will not be able to either meet the moment or you will make a decision that somebody else has already made for you. And so playing in that band of 40% to 70%, as I think about this crisis and the issue as I related to the health crisis and then moving into the recovery, that's what the team at Walker and Dunlop is constantly trying to look at is, okay, when do we have 40% of the relevant information that we're actually going to survive this thing and get through it and that our finances are going to weather the storm. And so we can start being, if you will, a little bit on the front foot and potentially starting to do things on a proactive basis. So get to that 40%. And yet at the same time, if you wait until you get to 70%, everyone knows that we're in the clear and all the opportunities to step on and do things are gone. Right. And so that's the framework we've been playing with. So to your point, as it relates to trade-offs and decision-making, yep. can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. So, so again, same, it's, really, it's largely the same question, but two things. So you, you, you have to have a way. I, I urge leaders of all shapes and sizes from all walks to, to find, find, find a good way to kind of, you know, etch out, sketch out those trade-offs for yourself, right? They're big. Some of them are amorphous, but they have to be sketched out nonetheless. And, and because you're always working, I think 4070, I think those bookends are absolutely spot on for all kinds of big decisions when there's a great deal of turbulence, right? Which, of course, a war or a military decision often is. They're very relevant here. So, so in that kind of environment, I always, leaders, some of the leaders I've coached, some of the leaders I've watched, some of the leaders, the leaders in Forge and Crisis all used, for example, their first mates, whoever those people were, so to speak, um, uh, and to, to bounce things off on, to articulate trade-offs. They also all wrote for themselves. I'm not talking about diaries. I'm not talking about to-do lists. I'm not talking about emails or memos. I'm talking about notes to themselves. Right? Lincoln was the master of this, you know, scribbling a note, right? What about if Louisiana does this, what about this for, for the rest of the South or for these slaveholding states? He did that a lot. So ways of parsing things out for yourself within the 40, 70 bookends that then allow you to say, here's what I've got here at this juncture, at this juncture. And then... Ultimately, the decision is made partly on information, which, as Willie just said, is 
is incomplete, but necessarily incomplete in terms of the effectiveness of the choice. And then partly it's on your best educated intuition. There's always, here's the real point. There's always an educated, call it a strategic leap of faith in these moments. Because so much is up for grabs, including on the opportunity side, and so much is unknown and chaotic and potentially really important on the downside. So you're trusting, as we all great leaders learn to do, this educated, your, your intuition, your best sense, you've made a lot of calls, you've gathered what you can, 50% of the information. What does your, your best experienced strategic intuition tell you? And then you make the leap of faith and you make your choice. So my final question on the, on the book and the leaders, and then I want to talk for a moment about the macro economy before we wrap. Um, you, 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 when you're talking about environmental activist Rachel Carson in your book, you, you talk about the fact that Carson took pleasure in the poetry of everyday life. So how can we take pleasure in the poetry of everyday life? Well, that's about getting off our devices, right, and getting somewhere where all the things we're doing in our work every day are just for a minute on low volume, right? You, you can't see the poetry of everyday life on the Zoom call with the phone buzzing quietly by your side and the, you know, the emails mounting up here as they flash across the top right side of your screen. You have to be able to distance yourself enough to, to soak that in. You know, the poetry of everyday life is, you know, your child bicycling on the driveway. They can't go to the park, but they're bicycling on the driveway. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, your do it's dancing with your dog very briefly because you're able to put, for a moment, the heaviness. This is such a heavy moment. The heaviness away. It's, I'm living alone, so I, this is, I am dancing with my dogs, but not, not being grabbed by a partner. It's grabbing a partner over this, well, well he or she is stirring the spaghetti sauce. The poetry of everyday the poetry of everyday life is the sun coming out in Boston after three days of torrential rain. It's really restorative and it's really important because it's both a source of our humanity and therefore our connection to other people and part of what feeds our souls. And our souls are not meant to die or wither here. They're meant to keep us vibrant and keep us compassionate and keep our character strong and worthy in this moment. So we need, we need to be able to see those slices. Um. You taught me a course called Business and Government in the International <laughs> Economy. Uh, as you look out at this virus running around the globe, and not only the battle that the United States is, 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 is waging today, but in both countries that have um, slightly less resources than we do, and then some other countries that have dramatically less resources than we do. Where's your, where's your mind as it relates to how long, not it takes the U.S. economy to get back up and going, but the global economy to get back up and going? I think in, in country, I mean, Bill Gates is talking a lot now about less developed, less industrialized countries and the extraordinary burden they're, they're, they're facing and they're beginning and, and facing and will face in much more intense form. Um, he's, he's, boy, talk about a leader in crisis. He, he, He's just really, he's growing by day, day by day as well. If you're watching his videos or watching his, his, his talks about the virus. Um, I, I think for, for, for a lot of the less developed world, this is going to be very, very hard. And, and, and I think a great question for the developed world, which isn't a question on the plate right now, but we're beginning to see glimmerings, not only in science, where there's this extraordinary cross-country, cross-national cooperation looking for therapeutic drugs and, and, and combinations, and particularly for a vaccine. Uh, we're beginning to see, even in the tortured, transactional, and sometimes very harsh world of global PPE, PPE suppliers, we're beginning to see the faint, first glimmerings of countries extending hands to each other. So I think a lot will depend on the leadership of the developed countries as they emerge from the worst of this in terms of cushioning or, or pushing up the bottom of the canyon for less developed countries. You always hope, and, you, and there's a reason to hope, this is not a fool's errand, that, that leaders will, will grow in compassion as well as competence, and, and, and those are of course products of our character, which we hope will be strengthened. And I think it'll be very interesting to see if the United States can step out of some of its isol isolationism of the last several years and say, we've weathered the worst and we will have before the leaves turn 
And now, now we want to help other countries. Or as we go along, here's what we can give to countries less fortunate than us. I think that's a very, very powerful opportunity as well as an obligation of the country. Um, Nancy, a question from Lucas Elser that says, um, in times of crisis, how can experienced leaders help grow new leaders during this time? Um, the most powerful way that you will help grow your new leaders around you is by showing up as your best self and then getting better. Because let me tell you, people are hanging on your every word. You have no idea how, me how much impact you have day to day. You on the Zoom call, you in the email, you if you ask someone about their child because they were worried they had their child tested. Children are now being, teenagers are now being tested for COVID-19. You have no idea. That impact will never leave them. So you are actually, without knowing it, making leaders every single day. Um, people are so hungry for, for men and women of courage, conviction, and kindness right now that, that that's your single best way right now. And, and, and what, with what time you have, what energy you have, you know, helping people understand what's going on and what you're learning, because we're all learning as we go. That's a huge piece that no one's yet talking about. We're going to learn a ton about how to be better and where our vulnerabilities are over the next several months. Dave Trager asked, does leadership come naturally or is it learned? It's, it's, well, leaders are completely made. I mean, endowments matter a small, in a small way, but it, as does experience. But the making of leaders is hugely about a commitment to say, I'm, this is my moment. I am going to lead with all I've got, and I'm going to commit to getting better and better at that because I'm all in and I'm in the game. So leaders are made. They're not born. And, they're, and, and that making is even faster and more powerful during these really difficult times. Forged in crisis. Yeah. So Greg Scully wants, a, it's a, kind of, if you will, to some degree, a cheat sheet on how do you <laughs> know what information to share and what information not to share at times of crisis? Um, you studied all these leaders. They had information in front of them that said, ah, I'm Shackleton and I'm seeing a dark clouds on the horizon. I'm not sharing that. Or I'm Lincoln and I, and I see some, if you will, uh, hope at the end of the tunnel. What, how do you sort that? And obviously it's so situation specific, yes. company specific, et cetera, et cetera. But anything for people to keep in mind is something uh, there? Br brutal honesty. In, in, when in doubt, this brutal honesty, credible hope combination it, it, and, a, and a huge amount of deftness, right? Deftness situation by situation. You, you don't want to withhold really important information, even dark information from people, because if they, know, if they learn in a very transparent, connected society or information flow that we live in, that you've withheld something that, they, that was relevant, they will lose trust for you and they will get anxious. So you have to be a combination of you know, both what to tell them, how much of something particularly hard to tell them. So yesterday, Andrew Cuomo said, the first man to say this on the national stage, that the longer you're on the, a ventilator, the more likely you are to die. If you look at the numbers worldwide, I have them from medical people at MGH, about 86% worldwide, this is from three days ago, of people on ventilators die. That's a very hard number. In Seattle, the only place where we have a lot of data right now, New York will soon be another place, it's about 70%. So that's a really big difference. Um, so he said that, and then he said, and here are the numbers about hospitalization and the number of people that are on ventilators. So you take that number that's really scary, and then you, in a sense, say, and here's what we're doing, and here's what we're learning about therapeutic drugs, and here's how many people, it's a relatively small percentage of hospitalizations, end up in the ICU intubated and on a ventilator. So that credible hope piece, married to the, the news from France, is very bad, is, and other relevant facts is, in, is quite important. So um, I want to go to the to one final question to you before we, we call it a day, because at the end of the day, this is all very personal and real. Somebody noticed that you've got ribbons over your shoulder in your costume <laughs> and is wondering uh, what kind of riding you do. I know the answer to this, so you, you answer it, because I think it is important. You, you're obviously missing your horses right now. Oh, my God. I just called the owner. Our, the barn is locked down. I'm, a, I'm an English. I write English. These are ribbons from uh, uh, jumping. I, I'm a, what's called a hunter or a show jumper. I could jump over very little jumps on nice horses that are much better at, their, at the sport than I am. And uh, most barns around the country are in lockdown So because it, the staff has to stay well to care for the horses, so they're not usually letting most clients or horse owners ride. 
I miss my horses. Talk about the poetry of everyday life. I miss them. I just miss them so much. Like the, you know, by Jesus, I really miss them. Well, um, I want to say um, thank you, Nancy. Your insight. Uh, first of all, your book. Let me plug it one more time. Fortune <laughs> Christ. Is I love you. Read. I have now read it twice because I read it when she came to our Sun Valley conference a couple of years ago, and then I. I uh, went back through my notes in preparation for this call today. But, Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to um, our clients and to our partners, um, please stay safe, stay healthy. Um, I know that there are specific questions that a lot of you sent in ahead of time as it relates to forbearance, as it relates to how to navigate these times. Um, please be in touch with your Walker & Dunlop bankers and brokers um, to uh, ask them specific questions. Uh, and we will get back to you as quickly as we possibly can to give you information and to help you through these challenging times. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank you again, Nancy, and um, I wish everyone a safe and happy day.